Well, here we are at Fairhaven College where Timothy came to gain all his knowledge. He hit his studies, he hit his books, it helped his grades, but not his looks. I didn't write that. Growing up here we had a beloved uh, bus captain, his name was Mr. Larry Crawford, and he wrote poetry, inspirational and funny. Um, I used to ride home or to work with him, but anytime we were coming home, of course I lived on campus here, so we would come home from work. I didn't, I don't know, I, he didn't work there, but somehow he was giving me a ride. I think his wife worked there and I got a ride back with him often. We would pull in the church and say, well, here we are, and there we'd go at Fairhaven College, and I'd learn all about Timothy. Of course, I don't know if that was true. I don't think he was inspired. I mean, he was inspirational, but I don't think he was inspired. But um, as I was studying for today's uh, message, I thought of that. I couldn't help think of that. And very fond memories about Larry Crawford. Uh, built the Lake Station bus route and uh, a lot of stuff there. Probably none of you know him or his kids. <laughs> but uh, it's fine. It's, it's good to hear about history. Um, Let's take our Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy, chapter 1. If you're a church member here, or if you were here over the summer, and you happen to be here on the Sunday that I was able to preach from Philippians about Timothy, you'll recognize some of what we're going to talk about this morning. But, um, oh, probably about a year ago, because for some reason I... I have this unique ability. I'm a prophet almost. I'm able to pick the days in the calendar that are going to be, you know, you know to preach in chapel, that are going to be chosen later for a guest to come in and preach at. So I think I only preached in chapel one time last year, even though I signed up for six. I just, I just have this unique ability. But this year, I get to be basically the first one. I know I get to be the first staff member to, uh, to preach to you all. Anyway, about a year ago, I was thinking, what should I preach? Um, I have lots of desires. I look at you all and think about myself back then. I can still remember back to there. Um, I think about what I see you doing with your life, the attitude that you have, the interactions that you have with one another, at least what uh, attitude and interactions appear to me as somebody who has worked with young people in the ministry for 25 years or more. Um, I think, what, what do these, what do we need? What does academy and college chapel need? And so I get ideas, listen, I could do this, I could do this. Um, I really like to preach through books of the Bible. I toil over one decision then, and then I don't have to decide for a long time until I finish that book, and then I have to decide again. But I think the Lord's led me, and, and with good reason for my thinking. Not, I don't, of course, God's reasons are always good, but my thinking, I think, has good reason to uh, teach and preach through Paul's personal epistles. In one sense, we think ah, Timothy, Titus, young men, um, when they got these letters, they weren't young men. Um, I think they were at least mid-aged. They'd been with Paul for a long time. But there's a lot of instruction there, and I think it, a lot of it, and I know all of it does, but a lot of it in particular applies to us as people growing up learning, growing up in the faith, and learning. And so we're going to continue on our way. Last year, I spoke on verse 1, and today I'm going to begin to speak on verse 2. I'm just, I don't think it'll be that slow all the way through the book, but that's where we are today. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. Uh, let's read verse 1, you know, just to get the context. There's so many, so, so long we have to go back. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior 
and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, and that's what we talked about last time, Christ is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. I want to speak today on Timothy, a faithful son. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this opportunity to share your word with uh, these young people. Lord, thank you for their uh, desire or uh, to whatever extent it is to train, be trained some more for your service here at Fairhaven Baptist College. Thank you for the parents of those in the academy who desire their children to be trained here in our school. Lord, thank you that you've given us your word and that in your word, even in our, what we think of as very complex and advanced society, in your word is still everything that we need, that if we will read, understand and obey it, we can have peace and joy in our life, direction, satisfaction even. Thank you that your word is that powerful and that effective that your spirit uses it each day to teach us. Today, as we look at these words from Paul to Timothy, Lord, I ask that you would help me to make plain your word, help me to make appropriate application, and help us, as we listen, not to see a man, but to look into your word, see the perfect law of liberty, and be changed thereby. I ask for your blessing on this time we have together. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to take a little bit of time and talk to you about Timothy, his life, and, um, and then I think by the time we do that, we'll have just a few moments to draw some concluding thoughts. First, let's think about his childhood. So we're not going to, we're not going to look very little, actually, at this verse. The second word says Timothy, and we need to know who Timothy is. So Timothy, uh, in his childhood, the, the Bible tells us some, of, some about his childhood. I think about, we can assume that this is childhood and into and maybe even perhaps through his teen years. We know who his parents were. Acts chapter 16, verse 1. This is Paul arriving in this area on his second journey. He comes to, uh, he came to, then came he to Derby and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, or named Timothy, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek. So we know that Timothy's mother was a Jewess, and so she taught him the scriptures. We know that his father was a Greek. We don't really know much beside that. The scripture says, but his father was a Greek, but I'm not gonna, we could read a lot or a little into that, but um, we don't hear anything else about his father. Um, all the rest of the times, Timothy is called a son, it's from the mouth of Paul. Um, but his father was a Greek. We could assume in Lystra and Derby that he, it occurs to me that maybe he had a, a more well-to-do family. Lystra and Derby were the, um, they were like, the low life is not, uh, the working class. They, they had their own, they didn't learn Greek. Remember when, when Paul was there and he got stoned? He didn't know that they were stoned talking about worshiping him because they spoke in their own language, the language of the Lycaonians or something like that. And he didn't know that language. He knew Greek. So they, but, but Timothy's father was a Greek. So he might have had a, a nicer upbringing, but from all indications, and there's, this is the only indication, his father was a pagan. Because, well, the other indication comes in the next verse. It doesn't say your parents taught you the scriptures. It says your mother and your grandmother taught you the scriptures. So, Timothy came from a blended family, blended spiritually. Oh man, so many things occur to me. Maybe his mother 
in later years regretted that she actually married outside the, the children of God. But she stuck it out and made sure that her son knew the scriptures. Let's move along. So, so much to contemplate and think about here. 2 Timothy 1.5 says, uh, Paul is again speaking to Timothy, says, When I call to remember the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that in thee also. So we know that uh, Timothy's mother and grandmother were believers. They became believers. Mother was a Jewess. It would seem clear that her mother was also, his grandmother was Jewish. Um, they must have been Jews that were uh, sensitive to the scriptures. And when they heard about Christ, they realized he was the fulfillment of the scriptures. They were believers. And that faith, they passed along, we might say, to, their, to Timothy. And while we say it that way, they passed it along, we should understand that it wasn't just a, heredi uh, a, a thing of hereditary, that since Timothy's grandmother was a believer and his mother was a believer, he was a believer. Because the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 3.15 that Timothy, from a child, had known the Holy Scriptures which were able to make him wise unto salvation. He himself had to come to salvation at some point. Um, we do not, and that salvation is through faith which is in Christ Jesus. We don't have a record of Timothy's conversion experience. And I will say uh, it's interesting how few records of conversion experiences there actually are, um, especially of young people. So in one sense, I'd encourage you, don't be... If, if you believe on Christ and you're following the direction of his Holy Spirit, don't get too worried over, was my conversion experience like this other person's that I heard about? Or was it like the Apostle Paul's? Or was it like this? Salvation is not bound up in something you've done or something that you experienced in a moment in time. So... But Timothy was saved. He was not saved because his mother and his grandmother was saved. And you are not saved because you grew up in a Christian home. Okay. But what happens in salvation if you grew up in a good Christian home may be harder to perceive the moment that it took place. But he was saved. So we, had, we, we see his, his parents and his grandmother his salvation. And then we find that he had quite a reputation, a good reputation. In Acts 16.2, we, we just read Acts 16.1, um, there was this certain disciple there named Timothy, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish and believed, but his father was a Greek, um, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. So Paul comes to Derby and Lystra on this journey. Oh, we have a map here. I don't know if I could show it to you there, but it's right, right there. He, <laughs> he went from Antioch uh, down along the, the, the Mediterranean, and on this journey, he went up, he went over land. And so he would have come to Derby first, and then into Lystra. It says Lystra and Derby, or Derby and Lystra. And then the next verse says Lystra and Iconium. So that draws me to the conclusion that um, Timothy's hometown was Lystra. I'm right, everyone else who says something else is wrong. Um, but I, I'm just, that's a joke. So, but it really doesn't much matter. But these two references to him both reference Lystra. So I think he's from there. It's interesting, though, that Iconium is a full 20 miles away from Lystra, which is a full day's journey in those times. It's a half hour journey for us, but it's a full day's journey back then. And the, the, the believers in Iconium, did I say the right thing? The believers in Iconium, a full day's journey away, knew about Timothy's work. He was well reported of by the believers in Iconium. How would that have happened? As a young man, either by himself or with others, he made the journey up there a full day to work with the believers in Iconium. 
Or maybe some believers from Iconium came down to Lystra to help the believers there, and they saw how Timothy was working among the believers as a young man. Either way, he had quite he had a good reputation. He was well reported of by the brethren, by the believers that were in Lystra and Iconium. And we know that at this point in time, Paul calls him, Paul asks him to come with him. He had to leave his home. Uh, there's no indication that he ever saw his home again, but he very well could have. There were churches there that were under Paul's care. But um, he left. And in his early adulthood, the age of many of you here, most likely, he joined Paul's team. And um, Paul took him, and they went, they continued on that journey. Before they finished that journey, he's left with Silas in Berea. Paul escapes again from Berea down to Athens, and Paul and, and Silas and Timothy stayed there. He rejoined Paul. Paul left Athens, went on to Corinth, and Timothy rejoined him there um, at Corinth. He preached with Paul and the others to the Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1.19 says, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silas and Timothy, or by Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. So he preached there. He's, as a young man, he's already, he's not, I guess I'm saying, he's not just there shining Paul's shoes, bringing him water. He's working in the ministry. He's preaching. He's left the great Apostle Paul, which I don't think people looked at Paul as the great Apostle Paul back then. But Paul left, and Silas and Timothy stay there with the believers in Berea. Um, so he, and he, he's working in the ministry with Paul. He was then sent back to the Thessalonians, if you remember. Paul, it seems to, the Bible seems to indicate that Paul couldn't go back to Thessalonians, there, to Thessalonica. It could be that, um, that the, uh, the, the believers there signed some type of an agreement with the, with the town that said, we will make sure that Paul doesn't come back here. Uh, there was quite an uproar there, and then the wording may indicate that. So Paul couldn't go back to Thessalonica, but he sent Timothy there. Uh, he talks about that in... Um, 1 Thessalonians, sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. And then when Timothy came back from them, he says, now when Timothy came from you to us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, uh, they, were, they were encouraged by that. Later in Paul's ministry, Timothy was sent to the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians 4.17, For this cause have I sent unto you Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord. Um, he was sent into Macedonia on Paul's third journey. Uh, Acts 19.22, So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timothy and Erastus, and he stayed there for a season. He was rejoined by Paul and then accompanied Paul into Asia again. When Paul was writing the book of Romans, Timothy sent his salutation to them. Timothy, my work fellow, and Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen, salute you, Romans chapter 16. So Paul, uh, Timothy is very much involved in Paul's ministry. Then in his early midlife, I would say this is uh, later, late 30s to early 40s, my estimate, he is confined by Paul in Rome. If we think about this, he joined Paul on his second journey. On his second journey, he spent, um, he spent a year and a half in Corinth. It took him several months even to get to Corinth. So there's probably three years there. Then he's, whatever time was between his second journey and his third journey, Paul was in Ephesus for a couple, two or three years on his third journey. And that was just that city on that journey. He comes back with Paul with the offering for the saints in, in Judea. And then Paul is arrested there. And so we know Paul is in Caesarea for at least two years. 
and then he journeys to Rome, and Timothy's with Paul in Rome at some point, whether he rode with him or caught up with him. So this is much, you know, many, many years. Timothy's well into his midlife, and he's confined with Paul in Rome, or he's with Paul in his confinement in Rome. We see that in Philippians 2, 19 through 23. In Philemon 1, Hebrews 13 could be um, associated with that too. In that time that Paul is in prison, he sends Timothy to the Philippians. Um, and somewhere in this time in his life, Paul leaves him at Ephesus. In verse 3 of 1 Timothy 1, it says, As I besought thee to abide still in Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some. So he left Timothy there in Ephesus. The book of 2 Timothy, some of our Bibles, I remember growing up, and maybe all of them, but some of our Bibles, after the last verse in the Bible, it would say, written by Tychicus or whatever. Uh, 2 Timothy, after the last verse in 2 Timothy, see if my Bible right now has this. Yes, the second epistle unto Timothy ordained the first bishop of the church of the Ephesians was written from Rome when Paul was brought before Nero the second time. So that is not inspired. I think that's some um, of current thought written back, and I don't mean current 2000s thought, maybe current 300s or 400s or 500s thought placed back into there. Because we know that the church at Ephesus had many pastors um, when Paul was returning from his third journey. He met with them in Miletus. Um, so, Timothy wasn't a bishop. There was no hierarchy. There wasn't bishops over the elders, and the elders were over the pastors. And the, you know, there wasn't that type of thing in the Bible. So, th that, that reading is... But we do know in 1 Timothy that Paul had left him there in Ephesus. So, um, but he, Timothy was not a bishop. But what was he? What was he? Was he a pastor? Was he the pastor of the church at, at Ephesus? Many people will say so. Um, I don't believe so. There, there was already bishops and pastors there. Um, was he an evangelist? Possibly so. But it seems that Paul endues him with a little more authority than just an evangelist. Was he an apostle? Uh, some might say that because he was given... The, authority to do things, but he was not an apostle in the sense that uh, Paul was, or any of the 12 disciples, or Barnabas was. Was he a prophet? We don't know what he is. Um, we weren't there. <laughs> but, so maybe he was an assistant apostle. You know, an assistant to the apostle, and dude with extra quasi or semi-apostolic authority. We don't know. Uh, he was very much a part of early Christianity. He was ordained. Uh, 1 Timothy 4.14 4 says, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. 2 Timothy 1.6 says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. The word ordained is not there, but most people would say that the, the laying on of hands is part of the process of ordination. So maybe he was ordained. Maybe he just had Paul's hands laid on him. He was sent by an apostle. Who, someone who is sent is an apostle. The apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ are sent ones. So he, but he was sent by an apostle. He was sent by Paul to the Corinthians. He was sent to the Philippians. He was, sent, he was left or sent to the Ephesians. A lot of, so we don't exactly know what Timothy was, and this will come up at later when we, we begin to see what Paul tells him. I just want us to get an idea about him. He's very much involved in the writing of the New Testament. We think of Paul's epistles as Paul's epistles. But Paul was joined in, by Timothy and others for some of these, but by, he was joined by Timothy in writing the epistle to the Philippians, to the Colossians, to the Thessalonians twice. Just look at those books. It says Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, or Paul and Timothy. So this is, he's joined by, by Timothy, uh, writing even to Philemon. A personal letter from Paul to Timothy is also from Timothy, or from Paul to Philemon is also from Timothy. Paul and Timothy to Philemon. 
uh, also to the, um, to the Corinthians. Um, those notes after the last verse in the book that are not inspired, they, they tell us that um, Timothy was the one used to pen Paul's words to 1 Corinthians and pr possibly also Hebrews, if we look at the postscript there. So seven or eight of Paul's 13 or 14 books was written with or by the hand of Timothy, and two more were written to him, right? First and second Timothy. So nearly three quarters of Paul's books involve Timothy. He's not a minor character in the Bible, in the New Testament. He's quite a major character. And his relationship with Paul is much to be, uh, much to be learned from. He was, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 17, For this cause have I sent unto you Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. So Timothy was able, he was his son, and he was so much part of Paul, he was able to, Paul was able to entrust him to teach his own ways to the Corinthians. Philippians 2.22, But ye know the proof of him, that is Timothy, that as a son with the father, he has served with me in the gospel. Uh, in our verse this morning, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. Uh, 1 Timothy 1.18, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee. Uh, 2 Timothy 1, 2 through 4, To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, I thank God, whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers, night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears. So this is, this is kind of a biblical biography of Timothy. What was his life? Who was he? And perhaps we'll get done early. But I want to just, in conclusion, think about three things. I want us to go back to what we were saying about his childhood. There were three things that we saw about his childhood. His parents and his grandmother, his salvation, and his reputation. I think what the Bible tells us about Timothy, he could have been any one of your ages at that time. His childhood, he could have been any one of your ages. And so what we learn about Timothy can be an immediate example to us. So if we look back on Acts 16.1, it says, Then came he, came he, talking about Paul, to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there, so he was a disciple by this time, named Timothy, or Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek. He had a Greek father and his mom, Eunice. It just occurs to me, and I just want to develop this a little bit, if there were any problems in Timothy's childhood, and there very well may have been, he clearly overcame them biblically. We don't know about his childhood. Paul doesn't emphasize it. Luke who writes this, doesn't delve into it, except to say that his father was a Greek, and that's the last we hear about his father. So if that was the last we heard about your father, we might say, oh, I have an awful childhood. My dad was unsaved. Or when my mother and grandmother believed on Christ, my Greek father couldn't handle that and abandoned us. We could make any, clear, many plausible suppositions here. But what I want us to just think about and maybe take encouragement from is that there's nothing in your past that can keep you from serving God today. There's nothing in your past that can keep you from serving God today. Now, I don't think there's any, and that truth applies across the board to more areas than what we would maybe suppose would be in Timothy's life. There's nothing. You know, you, you might look around and say, almost all the people I go to school with 
their homes are. I wish I had a home like theirs. Your home is not keeping you from serving God today. You might, you might look into your own past, and this can happen even with people as young as you are, as we are, however you want to say this. You might look into your own past and say, ah, I can't do anything for God now. No, it's not true. There's nothing, there's not a single thing in your past that can keep you from serving God today. God is, among other things, he's merciful. I remember when, um, I'm not going to quote it exactly like he did, but a, a thought that I heard, um, I'm forgetting his name, the developer, the runner of Master Clubs, um, Ab Thomas, yes. When he was here, he said something to this effect. You're only one prayer away from a clean slate. You're only one prayer. You're sinning. You have sin. You look back. Oh, you're only one prayer. Turn to God in prayer and he forgives. You're only one prayer away from God's forgiveness. There's nothing in your past that can keep you from serving God today. God is merciful. He is faithful. He's faithful to his word. The things that he says in here are true. And if he said something, he'll be faithful to it. He's faithful to his own. He will not let his own down. He is always near. Uh, a pastor was talking about, uh, writing about the two on the road to Emmaus. Remember them? They're on the road to Emmaus. They're dejected. They think their world has fallen apart. They had put their hope in Christ, and now he was gone. You ever feel like Christ is gone? Feel like the two on the road to Emmaus? They thought he was gone, and yet he was walking right next to them, wasn't he? God is always near. We can see that in the Psalms. We can see that throughout scriptures. Even when we don't see him, even when we can't sense his presence, he is near. He's faithful. He's always near. He's always wise. He's always wise. We can look at the circumstances in our lives, and we can't figure out how, how they could be good at all, how they make any sense. But God is wise. We are not wise. God is. God is good. He is good. He's always good. Bad things in our estimation can happen to us. But everything that happened to us, God works out for his good. God is gracious. We don't have to work for any of God's faithfulness. He freely gives everything. Beyond our, beyond our comprehension, he gives He's sovereign. That's some of what we've kind of touched on that a little bit with his faithfulness. God can take whatever difficulties, whatever problems, or whatever mess others or you yourself have made, and he can work them out for his good. There's a way we don't sin so that God's grace can be given more, but God can take the mess you've put yourself in or the mess that others are in around you that puts you in a mess, even that mess, God in his sovereignty can use it for his good. Trust him. Turn to him. So, whether Timothy's situation was as bad as yours or not, what we learn from Timothy is that God can use it's never too late. There's nothing in your past that can keep you from serving God today. Another thing, I just want to point out, 2 Timothy 1.5, about, about Timothy's childhood. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, 
and I'm persuaded that in thee also. I just want to think about that. Timothy got what he was in a human sense from his mother and his grandmother. A young man learned from his mother and his grandmother. We can talk about the human nature. This came up yesterday. I see it often. Young men, our human nature makes it easy for us, especially at our age right now, to bristle at our mothers. I'm not saying everyone does it, but it's easy. You're wanting to establish your manhood. And your mother says, you're going to do this. Or whatever. Whatever the circumstances. I, it, I, just, I watch human nature enough to see that it happens often. I'm not saying every case. But Timothy, he learned from his mother. It seems very clear that Timothy honored and obeyed his mother and his grandmother. And so, young man, I ask you, What's your, what's your relationship with your mother? What's your relationship with your mother? Mothers are human beings too, but don't take that as, as an excuse not to have a good relationship with her. So first, are you a submissive, obedient child? And this is what happens. When I started my conclusion, I had plenty of time and I have two more points of conclusion in about two and a half minutes to get through them. Second, are you saved? Are you saved? From a child, Timothy knew the scriptures which were able to make him wise unto salvation. Well, I kind of said some of this already, but salvation comes from hearing the scriptures. Salvation comes through faith in Christ Jesus. Not through being born into a particular family, not from going to church every week all your life. Salvation comes from faith in Jesus Christ. What is faith? Faith is not a prayer. Faith is not, an act, is not some ritual. But faith involves obedience. Faith involves obedience. And Faith in Christ. Who, what does Christ mean? Christ is the title of a man. Christ is Jesus' one of, Jesus' title. Christ was the Messiah. Who was the Messiah? He's the king. So a king normally demands obedience. So there's the element of faith in Jesus as the Savior that we understand, but sometimes we don't understand the element of faith in Christ as the promised Messiah and King, our Lord Jesus Christ. When you're saved, you've turned from your sin and believed on Jesus. Who is Jesus? A friend of mine says, Jesus is not a jar of peanut butter. Someday I'm going to preach a sermon. Jesus is not a jar of peanut butter. And we all could say, well, that's almost blasphemous. Of course Jesus is not a jar of peanut, peanut butter. But what is Jesus? If he's not a jar of peanut butter, between jar of peanut butter and what he really is, you can't believe on a jar of peanut butter to be saved. You've got to believe on Jesus. You've got to believe on the Jesus that the Bible tells us about. And let's move along. Are you saved? Are you a submissive, obedient child? Are you saved? And last, have you proven yourself to believers? Timothy was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra. Iconium, as I already said, was about 20 miles north of Lystra. What are the reports of the brethren about you? What are the reports of the brethren about you? How do mature believers interact with you? Do they interact with you with kid gloves? Are they afraid to offend you? Are they like... Or, are they, do they bluntly tell you you need stuff to do? That you're on the wrong path? Are they coaxing you to keep on the right path? I don't think, I don't think the believers would have given a good report to Paul if, if Timothy was the guy that's like, well, we hope. 
well, at least he did this. Let's see what God will do. No, he was well reported of by the brethren. Are mature believers always prodding you to change your ways? Is there something in your life that, like, this godly man is, like, trying to push you along this way, and this other godly man is trying to push you along this way? If they are, you're not a Timothy. Step back from your own life. Step back from your self-esteeming view of your life. Think back to interactions with mature believers. What are those believers trying to accomplish in your life? Now, every one of us should want to grow and we should want believers to be encouraging us. But if you, have, if you can get enough maturity just to step back and say, okay, well, there was that interaction with that man. What was he saying? What was he trying to accomplish in that conversation I had with him? What do I have? Have I proven myself to believers, to mature believers? Let the Holy Spirit take these thoughts and challenge you and help you grow from them. Let's pray together. In a moment, we'll have a quick time of invitation.